Welcome to the first case study of the webinar Best Practices for Phenotypic Drug Discovery created by the Best Practices in Medicinal Chemistry Working Group for the European Federation for Medicinal Chemistry. We are going to look at a fascinating phenotypic drug research program to find new drugs against a devastating disease in young children. In this case study webinar, however, we focus on some key aspects to highlight some of the topics that were introduced in the main webinar and will not be able to go into the full details of that complex research. Spinal muscular atrophy, or SMA, is the leading genetic course of infant and toddler mortality. It is caused by a mutation or deletion of the SMN1 gene, or survival of motor neuron 1 gene. This results in low levels of functional SMN protein, which plays a key role in motor neuron development. There's also another gene called SMN2, which undergoes alternative splicing, which means that particular exons or regions of that gene may be included within or excluded from the final processed messenger RNA, the mRNA, that is produced from that gene. This SMN2 can also lead to the production of functional SMN protein, but predominantly leads to an unstable, truncated, SMN delta 7 protein, which comes from the mesen exon 7. The idea for the therapeutic concept now was to find a splicing modifier that would shift the outcome of the SMN splicing toward the production of full length SMN mRNA and consequently functional SMN protein expression. Since it was at that time not known, what factors ultimately influence the splicing of that gene, this concept was realized in a phenotypic approach. To explain this in a little bit more detail, this slide illustrates the respective pre-messenger RNAs coming from the gene, the RNA and the proteins. With the disease causing mutation present on the far upper left side and no therapeutic intervention, the SMN1 gene would not be functional and not lead to any RNA for functional protein. On the right, the SMN2 gene could be transcribed into mRNA and still untreated would lead to mostly RNA missing the exon 7 after splicing, leading, as mentioned, mostly to the unstable form of the protein. In case of an effective treatment, however, in form of a splicing modifier, this would then lead to the RNA, including the exon 7, which would then ultimately lead to an increase in functional protein. Now, how could the screening be set up? The researchers constructed a human cell line with a certain gene construct. They inserted a SMN2 mini gene reporter construct that contains luciferase after the exon 8 and before that the exon 6 and 7, but with a specific reading frame codon. So only in the case that the full length SMN2 mini gene containing exon 7 would be produced, the luciferase would be in frame with the translation initiation codon just mentioned, and only that case would produce the active luciferase, leading to a measurable readout. In case of no effective modulation of the splicing by the drug and missing exon 7, the luciferase gene would not be readable due to the out-of-frame situation and thus not generate the signal. So with this fairly robust assay system in form of a human cell line established, the researchers team could perform a screen of quite a number of compounds and around 200,000 compounds were evaluated. This resulted in around 2,000 primary hits, which were then further triaged. First, an orthogonal assay was performed to remove those compounds, which would just unspecifically lead to a signal by activating the luciferase directly, but not through the proper splicing modulation. This was performed by essentially analyzing the same cell system, but with a different readout, as we have learned it in the webinar, a common way for orthogonal assays. In this case, really looking for the protein expression by PCR method. Out of that, the research team selected three series for initial MedChem optimization using a homogeneous time-resolved fluorescence assay 
to measure the increase of SMN1 protein in cells. Also, the team improved the PK properties of certain examples, resulting in several tool compounds that were suitable for further in vitro characterization of the therapeutic concept. On the other hand, shown on the right side, it was also possible to generate an advanced tool named SMNC3 with properties suitable for in vivo studies, giving rise to more experiments and safety evaluations as mentioned in the main webinar. First, this compound was used in a SMA mouse model with genetic modification that manifests in a mild form of this SMA disease. These animals have a normal lifespan but show muscle weakness. The tool compound, when dosed at a certain level, indeed increased the target gene mRNA level significantly, as represented here by the colored bars, hours after dosing in form of a fold increase over the vehicle. So this was the first in vivo confirmation of the mode of action, but further proof would be necessary to connect the concept with the clinical outcome. So the compound was tested in a yet more severe model where the mice lack the exon 7 and exhibit a severe form of SMA, dying early. Also here, the tool compound showed efficacy as depicted in the graph, increasing overall longevity of the treated animals shown in blue and black colors versus control shown in red. The next step was then to verify if the effects could also be generated in patient-derived cells as a system close to the real clinical setting as opposed to the rodent experiments. This is shown on the upper right. Using fibroblasts from type 1 SMA patients, it could be demonstrated that the compounds dose-dependently increase the SMN protein. A further experiment is highlighted here at the bottom right, taken from many other experiments reported in the literature that were employed to verify the hits and the therapeutic concepts. Now this experiment, it shows that also in motor neuron cultures from iPSC-derived cells from a SMA type 1 patient, an increase in SMN protein could be observed after compound treatment. Now, with this information in hand, the question around the elucidation of mechanism of these drugs arose, and we are going to highlight a few of the experiments that were performed. Summarized in the first box on this slide is basically a gene expression profile analysis. Around 11,000 genes were analyzed by means of RNA sequence analysis, or RNA-seq, if they were influenced by the drug compared to control profile. And we have discussed this in the main webinar. Only six genes were actually up or down regulated significantly, and none of these genes could then afterwards directly be linked to the SMN expression or to the SMA pathogenesis. And further omics experiments were deemed necessary. In a different experiment, the influence of the compound on splicing was performed thereby a data-driven analysis of alternative splicing events compared to untreated on the RNA level can be performed. Splice junctions are basically the exon-intron connections where splicing takes place. Affected splice junctions that have an impact on the outcome in regards to RNA levels are characterized by changes in absolute or relative count. This resulted in 20 splice junctions, of which two shared the critical splice junction regarding exon 7. Taking this omics data together, the researchers could postulate that the compounds most likely act via an interaction with specific primary or secondary RNA structures in the SMN pre-mRNA, or interaction with specific protein RNA complexes. To further substantiate the elucidation data, a chemoproteomic approach was also performed. Therefore, an affinity probe was designed out of one of the aforementioned tool molecules that resulted from initial MedChem optimization. The SMNC2 molecule was appended with a suitable linker containing a photocross linker moiety. This was then incubated at high concentration with the cells and UV radiation to crosslink. Then RNA extraction was performed. 
after streptavidin pulled down, the collected RNA was transcribed to DNA. This led to the finding that the exon 7 is actually not directly the target. Moreover, a certain sequence motif that appears several times in the genome, but also close to exon 7, was identified. But interaction of SMNC2 with its binding motif did not explain the selectivity of SMNC2 as a pre-mRNA splicing modulator to the fullest. There are more than 15 sequences like this in the SMN2 gene alone, in addition to a larger number within the whole human genome. To look for additional cofactors that would contribute to the selectivity, a proteomic analysis was performed by photocross-linking cell lysates in the presence of the SMNC2 probe, following by immunoblotting for biotinylated proteins. This Western blot analysis, which is not shown here, revealed a so-called FUBP1, amongst others. This FUBP1 was then also confirmed by separate pull-down experiments using the probe in competition with free ligand. These results, together with several other experiments not shown here, um, that were performed but are beyond the scope of this case study webinar, strongly suggest that FUBP1 is a potential protein target for the drug molecules. This SMNC2 compound, the SMN2 pre-mRNA exon 7, and this splicing activator, just named, form a ternary structure. The ultimate mechanism of action is thereby that the drug compound bind the SMN2 pre-RNA and increase the affinity of the RNA binding to the splicing activator FUBP1 alongside with another activator that is not discussed here in more detail. Ultimately, this mechanism leads to the increased production of exon 7 containing RNA and downstream to the increased levels of functional protein. This case study, even if we only present the research case in a nutshell here, nicely highlights that a well-arranged combination of experiments and high persistence can lead to the successful elucidation of the target of a phenotypic drug. Please also check out the second case study on phenotypic drug discovery in a separate video. Thanks for your attention.